we'll start the session on open forum 35 in a, in a minute so if you would like to request uh, the participants to come in and sit in the front table makes it closer to you with the microphone if you would like to say something later Okay, uh, very good morning and also warm welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, now it's Open Forum 35, Strengthening Digital Transformation Through Digital Security. Uh, first of all, my name is Reza Revlusman. I'm from uh, Indonesia IGF. And I'm very uh, thank the, the IGF for allowing this initiative to be Open Forum in the IGF 2019. And I'm glad that we have a uh, a uh, very sunny morning today and I hope this will allow more discussion for us to be in this uh, forum. Uh, I would like to introduce our panel here. Uh, the first one we have Irene Putranto, researcher at the Citizen Lab University of Toronto. Uh, she deals with issues such as uh, internet governance and new technologies. Uh, second speaker, we have uh, Mr. Jamar Juniarto from Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. It's a regional organization that focuses on defending digital rights. And we have also Matthias Pilkam, Executive Director of Algorithm Watch. Uh, Matthias is a journalist, he's still a journalist, and a steering committee of the German, Germany IGF. So that will be the, the speaking order for uh, today as well. Uh, just to s set some, some context that, uh, a little bit of context of this discussion today, that uh, the, de the development of internet is coupled with the spread of negative content, and, and, and it could be in the form of uh, news, memes, and other things. Many governments are trying to keep up with the trends by employing different kinds of policies. But it is the proper one for the people. So we will have uh, our, our panel to, to say what they're uh, thinking about these uh, issues. So I think I would like to start by giving the floor to Irene to start. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Reza for moderating this session, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Irene Potranto. I am a senior researcher for the Citizen Lab. We are a cybersecurity and human rights uh, research lab based at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. So we're here to talk about uh, the concept of fake news, which is uh, problematic because there's no broadly accepted definition for it. It has been used to refer to wide-ranging content, uh, including uh, disinformation, illegal content, misleading or false content, as well as manipulated or fabricated content, among others. With regard to Indonesia, the worry is that in such a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious society, the spread of fake news, or otherwise called ho hoaxes or rumors, may lead to widespread violence. The hoaxes that have circulated in Indonesia, for example, has involved sensitive issues such as ethnicity, race, religion, intergroup relations, and politics, among others. And especially during major events, like at times of elections, the issue of fake news become even more pressing, 
because as the last Indonesian election shows, when you have 245,000 candidates running for office, from the presidency to local legislative seats, the stakes are incredibly high. Despite having the highest freedom index in Southeast Asia, according to Freedom House, it is clear that the problem of fake news uh, is a challenge to the promotion and protection of human rights online as well, as well as offline in Indonesia, and has led the Indonesian government to shut down the internet twice in 2019 thus far. To address the proliferation of fake news, many governments around the world have undertaken some harsh measures, including shutting down the internet, as I mentioned, um, that Indonesia did uh, following uh, protest in the uh, Papuan region. And these measures are put in place in the name of fighting fake news. Um, they are often drafted and implemented without a multi-stakeholder process, and therefore lacking in accountability and transparency. They are also often implemented in addition to existing draconian laws, including criminal defamation laws, cybercrime laws, and cybersecurity laws, which tend to have vague and overly broad provisions. So I'll stop here now, and I give the floor to Damar. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Damar Juniarto. Uh, thank, you, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm the executive director of SafeNet, so this is a freedom of expression network based in Denpasar, Bali. But uh, I also advisory board for Digital Rich uh, Asia uh, based in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. So I will start with uh, the problem of fake, uh, fake news in Southeast Asia. Yeah, we are uh, aware that fake news uh, hoax us or misinformation become pro problems in Southeast Asia region, but uh, SafeNet monitor that in some countries uh, in Southeast Asia, the government obviously used the fake news as an, 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 an ex excuse to silence criticism. While in some other, the government used fake news to justify their, their action against humanity. Uh, countries uh, already known for heavy-handed control on the internet are using fake news to Say, sees more, even more control on news outlet and communication platform. What unique about the context uh, of the Southeast Asia region is that the fake news and disinformation dis operate within the uh, framework where ex existing law uh, already inhibit uh, freedom of expression. So in countries like Philippines, Indonesia, and Myanmar, disinformation and hateful rhetoric online had uh, serious consequences for public opinion. In cases like Cam Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Singapore, uh, where there are existing law that curtail uh, freedom of expression, social media has become the new avenue for government to exercise control over free speech. So start from 2017, many uh, Southeast Asia have a national election process. The government are trying to exploit concern over fake news in order to adopt proposal to increase state control of our online communication and expand censorship and internet sur surveillance. In 2017, Malaysia government, during former Prime Minister Najib uh, Razak, released Akta uh, 803 uh, about Berita Tak Benar. So this is the first fake news law in the region, and then following by Singapore in 2018. And in October 2019, uh, the Thai government told uh, every corner, eh, sorry, every coffee shop owners to submit their consumer Wi-Fi browsing records as a part of the ministry campaign against fake news. This legislation in the surface look uh, cool, look great, but in the practice, government actually start granting itself the power to remove a competing narrative that against uh, or not in line with their narratives. So. Uh, in case of Indonesia, as uh, Irene just mentioned, Indonesia choose instant way to combat fake news or hoax. While amplifying in media or events like uh, IGF about a national campaign against hoax, but in May 2019, Indonesia government start to use bandwidth throttling and also use internet shutdown in August till September 2019 to handle the spreading of fake news or, or hoax related to uh, social conflict in Papua. Actually, this government uh, aren't uh, concerned about the fake news, but they are concerned about their official, official narratives be, being countered by speech carried on the platform. 
that they can directly control. So fake news legalization is an easy way to grant their, themselves the power they need to uh, nuke the content that contradict with the government portrayal of events, in, incidents, and allow, also uh, lawmaking efforts. Uh, it's uh, also have to mention that uh, uh, the, the, the issue about the fake news is also often uh, overshadowing the state sponsor disinformation of operation uh, in some countries. So uh, the, actually the government uh, is behind uh, some, some campaign that uh, spreading about the fake news and also disinformation, but uh, they, they cover it with the, uh, this uh, PR stunt. So I will stop in that and then I will continue uh, if I have time to uh, talk about the cyber security in uh, Southeast Asia, thank you. Okay, thank you, Irene and Damar, who already setting up the what kind of the discussion today, and we already have the the perspective from Asia, Southeast Asia. Now, I would like to give to the floor to Matthias, hopefully to give some perspective from the European side, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Yes, I would like to start by stating that, uh, unfortunately, I have no first-hand knowledge of the situation in Indonesia. Um, I only know about this from uh, reading in the media. I've known um, Indonesian colleagues for a while, um, but this uh, doesn't make me any kind of expert on, for example, the problem of disinformation in Indonesia. That's why I would like to focus on some general remarks, and I'm very cu curious to hear how you think they apply to uh, that situation there. So um, we see a, um, a very critical uh, situation in the dissemination um, of information on uh, large platforms, namely, of course, Facebook, um, Google and YouTube, uh, Instagram, if you want to um, argue that this is different from the Facebook platform, which in, you know, in practice it has an entirely different uh, logic, but it is owned by the company WhatsApp and so much more. So um, we do appreciate the fact that um, there, is, um, there are attempts to address the problem of spreading information that incites to hatred and violence. At the same time, I share the doubts that, was, that were already voiced before by uh, the other two speakers, um, that there are good ways to tackle this without the risk, at least, of harming freedom of expression. Um, we have a very specific experience here in Germany, where we, uh, about two years ago, uh, enacted a law that is called the Network Enforcement Law. Um, globally, it's known as the Facebook Law because people do see that the organization or the company that is addressed with that is mainly Facebook. And this law has many uh, problematic sides to it. Um, for example, what has been criticized by civil society, business, and academia in Germany is that it opens the door to, or it, it doesn't open the door, it gives incentives to overblocking, meaning that if you have very high fines that can be leveled against uh, companies, even if they are as big as Facebook or Google, you just run the risk that um, they will censor, I'll use the word consciously, censor more content than they would if they were not threatened with these kinds of fines. Um, there are good parts in the law, and again, that is something that we may want to discuss here, how these aspects could help um, situations um, elsewhere. Because, for example, what was included in the law is that the, for the first time, um, companies, the social networks, like, I mean, over two million users, that's the threshold in Germany, um, social networks have to accept um, legal documents, whereas before, <clears throat> they were always able to, for example, redirect um, private citizens who wanted to complain uh, in a legal sense. For example, they said that there was some um, libelous information uh, posted on Facebook, um, and Facebook did not take down that content. If they then 
initiated um, legal procedures, Facebook told them to go to Ireland and translate their statement to English before they could do anything, because this is where the company's European headquarters are. Uh, this, I think, is entirely unacceptable for companies that make huge revenues in the countries they are active in. Um, and, uh, for example, this is one part of the law that uh, I, as a person, but also Algorithm Watch as an organization, and also Reporters Without Borders, uh, um, the German section, which I'm a board member of, um, actually uh, applauded. Um, but in general, um, what we do see is, as I said before, there is a risk of um, overblocking when you're enacting these laws, and also, um, Although we think it is important to think about the large platforms, we should never forget that many problems with free speech do not stem from the use of social media. And we have a couple of lesson lessons uh, to learn here in Europe ourselves. For example, um, when we are arguing that the spread of disinformation and hate speech is so problematic, but at the same time do not take any action against uh, government uh, control of uh, media in countries like Hungary or Poland, um, then uh, maybe we are uh, not looking in the wrong direction, but at least not looking in all directions we should be looking in. Um, and I'll end um, with something that uh, we are working on intensively and colleagues of us are also working on this intensively um, and I would like to cite um, Mozilla here as an organization, the Mozilla Foundation. Um, we are looking into ways to get more information from the platforms to better understand how the spread of information is working, what impact it has, and for example also what measures have an impact on the spread of information. And so far, in most cases, we are in a situation that we are entirely um, at the, uh, let's say, uh, we are entirely um, in a situation where we have to trust what the platforms tell us. For example, Facebook said that they would initiate a large program on um, uh, now, what's the word? Uh, detecting uh, wrong information, fact-checking, basically. Uh, a large fact-checking uh, endeavor. And they would flag um, information as either trustworthy or not. And then afterwards, uh, they published a lot of numbers about what effects that had and how the spread of these um, wrongful news diminished or uh, deteriorated after this measure was implemented. But we have to believe their numbers. There is no way to control or verify these numbers from the outside. And that is not a situation that we as societies want to be in. So what we are thinking about is how to change this situation and get access to more data from the platforms to be able to externally verify their claims. And this is something that I would have loved to discuss today with the representative of Google, but as you can see, he didn't show up. Okay, uh, thank you, Matthias. I, I see that this problem is not like, entirely exclusive on the uh, certain region. Uh, we still have ample of time to discuss and <clears throat> Also, would love to uh, have some views. If there's another views from other region outside Southeast Asia or maybe outside Europe, so I would like to open the question and answer session or maybe comments if you have, and then we'll start the first session. If anybody would like to give comment or question, please raise. Or, or maybe I, I start by, um, I have question to, to Damar. Uh, is it, uh, which, which region that you think that uh, people or, or the world can, can draw a good comparison? Because I, I see that maybe this problem is not only in Indonesia or in, in Southeast Asia, do you have a recommendation or suggestion where we should look over? Thank you, Reza. Actually, uh, 
the reason why I am uh, went to the, this IGF in Germany, I want to learn about the, how the German uh, doing with the Nest DG. Uh, the, the law that forbid a lot of uh, hate speech in uh, social media. Since, um, and also w I want to compare uh, how the fake news and hate speech in, uh, in the Europe uh, becomes. Um, I will tell a, a little more about the, how the fake news is uh, evolving in Indonesia, in uh, our country. So fake news is on, not only about uh, spreading uh, misinformation, actually. It's been, uh, 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 the, it's been weaponized, uh, the social media, to attack people uh, within the platform. So I, uh, for years, SafeNet have seen a uh, number of threats and number of attacks to women uh, at risk communities like journalists, uh, anti-corruption activists, environment activists, LGBTQ, uh, religion minorities, who's being attacked digitally and also physically. Uh, they use the fake news as a way to, to uh, send terror to person, to, to these groups. So uh, we lately also uh, witnessed the, the, what we call a cyber amok, like a, a form of mass harassment towards a person of our groups, or mass violence toward a, a people or groups who supported a politician who runs as governor of Jakarta, or toward activists who, who against the revision of corruption or eradication commission law, or mass coordinated action to give one star review of a uh, tempo, a uh, mainstream media outlet, to make the Google Play Store then uh, automatic, un automatically delisting or delete the media apps just because the media made a magazine cover illustrating uh, Pinocchio nose uh, uh, over the figurative look of our Indonesian uh, president. Just uh, happened um, within this week, uh, the cyber amok uh, against uh, Tula Jules perfume uh, store in uh, France for mistakenly related to Tule Jules Bakery in uh, Indonesia. Uh, uh, the, this amok is, uh, is uh, using the, 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 the spread of fake news as a way to, uh, to uh, mass coordinate person to uh, give the one review uh, up, uh, in the uh, app store. So I, I will like to uh, seek a comparison uh, from the Germany uh, from the Nest DG, is it, is it Nest DG will be the uh, proper uh, or the uh, ideal uh, way to uh, controlling the hate speech inside the social media or not? So that's why uh, uh, I went here and then I want to listen and also uh, learn from everybody uh, in this idea. Yeah, maybe I respond to that directly. So uh, just to clarify, as Algorithm Watch, we, uh, let's say, don't have a clear position on this uh, because when the NetCG was discussed in Germany, the organization had just been created. But uh, Reporters Without Borders took a very clear position and said um, the law is overly broad and in detail it is very um, shoddily done. Let's put it that way. Um, the main issue, as I already said in my opening statement, was that there is this fear that there are incentives of um, overblocking, so that too many too, um, content items will be taken down um, because there are these large fines um, that the companies are threatened with. So whenever someone says something that is, let's say, on the borderline um, between a um, content item, I'll call it that, can be a video, text, uh, image, or whatever, that is protected by freedom of speech and something that we would consider illegal in Germany, then it will be taken down. Um, now, the government also obliged the platforms to provide more transparency about this in reports. So far, unfortunately, at least that's my interpretation, these reports are very inconclusive. So we can neither say that this overblocking has happened, nor can we definitely say that it hasn't happened, right? So it, probably we need a little more time about this. 
uh, for this, to assess this. Also, the German government has not published a good evaluation of the law itself, which they promised to do, um, and we need to follow this closely, you know, um, hopefully also because it is such a global issue, the government will also publish this report in English. I don't know that, you know, but uh, it's, it's good that I participate here because I could send them an email and say, you know, it's important enough to publish this information in, email, in English, uh, please do so. Um, now, what we are asking for, uh, and this is something that um, such laws could also facilitate in other countries if they decided to devise them, is that it may be a good idea, and it really heavily depends on the legislation, on the concrete legislation in the country, how to go about it, and Indonesian law will be entirely different from German law. It can be a good thing to strengthen the enforcement of um, controlling illegal content. And I'm really talking about illegal content here. I do not like to use expressions like um, fake news or even problematic or hateful content, because this should be about illegal content. Now, if illegal content cannot be removed from the platforms, that is a huge problem. If you don't have enforcement measures that enable you to remove that illegal content, that should be changed, right? At the same time, and I'll end on that, if we enact these laws, we should make very sure that platforms should at the same time be obliged to offer effective channels of contestation. So for example, if someone has his or her content taken down, they should be easily able to address the platform and, and say and argue, you wrongfully removed that content. This is protected by freedom of speech. This is not illegal speech, so give me an avenue um, to change this. And if this is not part of the law, and it's not really part of the, I mean, not effectively part of the German law, uh, then I would see this as a major drawback and a you know, major flaw in such a law. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, from, from your last statement, I think I, I just remember that because I'm from Indonesia, uh, in Indonesia there's uh, a website uh, which uh, it, it named Stop Hoax. So I think it's a like public participation website to identify uh, the 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 wrong news. So because in Indonesia we every day we can see in in the, in the our WhatsApp people share something information content without knowing the 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 illegal the, the legality or trueness of this information so uh maybe we can we can have a, a, a question from one uh, lady first and then second from please Hello, um, and thank you for those remarks. I was wondering, maybe this is more directed to Matthias, but... Um, sorry, sorry, can you identify yourself oh, first? Hi, I'm Nicole Arabian from Ofcom, the communications regulator in the UK. Um, I was wondering, you talked about, about uh, NetDG's, oh, yes, I think that's the short form. Um, I think you probably might be following discussions going on at the EU level about the Digital Service Act. Um, there's a lot of discussions about the fact how that might be contradictory to some extent, some uh, local laws or national laws. So I was just wanting to get your point of view on that and um, what do you think will be the way forward um, with this act if it's enacted? Okay, I have to be a little um, uh, humble here. Yes, I am trying to follow the discussions about the Digital Services Act, but there is no um, no draft that we can really uh, talk about. Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on, um, and I would uh, reiterate what I just said. You know, if we come up with ideas of how to control this, we have to make sure that the users um, have enough options to contest 
the decisions that are made by platforms. I think this is uh, a core function of uh, such a law. Now, what, from, from what I understand, and maybe you know uh, more about this, from what I understand, there's also <clears throat> the discussion now starting whether um, we should um, shed the um, liability privileges um, from the notice and takedown um, idea, you know, um, and make um, platforms and companies, let's call it, more liable for the content they have on their platforms. I'm doubtful that this will be a um, possible solution to the problem we are facing because, again, I'm a big critic of the way companies like Facebook and Google slash YouTube behave. At the same time, we have to appreciate that they opened channels of communication that we did not have before, and we, don't, we do not want to destroy those. So I can make only this quite you know, um, diffuse statement that we'll have to look at it closely whenever there is a clear proposition of what is being done, whether that strikes the balance that, that we envision. You know, it's not very helpful, but this is the state of the discussion I think we are in right now. Uh, hello. My name is Sridhi Prayamaji. I'm from Nepal. I'm going to share a, a case that happened in Nepal. So what had happened in Nepal was uh, uh, there was this singer who sang a, a song about the current corruption happening in Nepal. So what the government of Nepal did was uh, they didn't go, uh, they didn't ask uh, Facebook to pull down the song, but they went individually with the police to the uh, person who was singing it down and changed the song and asked him to upload it again. So, you know, things are working in a different way in, in a lot of the places, and the problem is the same. You know, it's, it's, there, is a, uh, there is a lack of definition in, uh, in between uh, the illegal content and the rest. So everything is, you know, termed illegal. So that's the best thing to do for the government because it's easy. And apart from that, if you look at the whole, uh, you know, dynamics of South Asia, uh, South uh, Asia, to be very specific, Asia, uh, you know, whenever policies are done, we, we don't go for surveys. I mean to say they will call, if there is some policies going on, they'll probably call few so-called experts. And, and these experts are either politically biased, either, you know, like they have their own regions. So that is the reason why policy don't come out in a proper way. And I think the best solution is, you know, multi-stakeholderism or multi-stakeholder practice is all about democracy. It's a democracy. Right? It is a democratic practice, but we don't see it as a part of democracy because our government, our uh, part of the region, we believe in, in, in closing, you know, we, we close everything. When we have to do a meeting, we'll go somewhere in a room and do it rather than coming out and opening it up. So that is the problem. And apart from that, the definition, as you mentioned, there is no definition. All the content, you know, like if they feel it's uncomfortable, they label, label it illegal. And that's, that is like majorly hitting all these things. And, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I've worked my way in, uh, right? So for 17 years, I've worked as a journalist. So I strongly believe that except for the, uh, you know, content that is really, you know, done by a news agency that turns out to be wrong, uh, there is no such thing as fake news. Because for a news to become a news, there is a certain standards and procedures, right? For any information, it cannot be a news, you know? I strongly believe in this because I went through that process and I know it, right? So I think we, we from the civil society, from the group, we, we need to uh, work our way. You know, if a media house does a mistake, there is a, um, there sh there is a certain organization, media organization that, that's supposed to take care of it, right? So this is the thing, you know, this is, you know, we, we are jumbling up everything. And that is the reason why it's, it's, we are in a mess. Because just because a US president came in and said fake news, fake news, fake news, we are going on fake news, fake news, fake news. Because it existed prior to, you know, President Trump. It was there. Disinformation was there. And, and we don't realize this. So I think a high time has come in when we start working on the basic uh, you know, problems that we have, especially when, when in terms of information dissemination and how information should be valued, how information should be categorized, 
Only then we can, uh, you know, reach out for successful policies. We can re make better mechanism to control all these activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good perspective from Nepal. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask uh, Irene if you have some comments on, because this is about terminology and lack of definition. Uh, is it fair to say fake news? Is it fair for journalists with the term terminology fake news? What do you think? I think, um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I think that term is, is very problematic, and I do agree with your view that it preceded uh, President Trump's use of the term, right? It is a global problem, and um, as more and more people become connected, um, and yet the speed of connectivity isn't necessarily accompanied with an increase in digital literacy. Um, it just becomes problematic to use the term fake news because, as Matthias said, it has been used to refer to a number of, you know, a wide ranging um, types of content, not just illegal and hit hateful content, but also false or misleading content, right? Um, but I actually want to get Damar's take on this because, as he mentioned earlier, um, the Southeast Asian region, uh, th there are a number of countries in that region that have uh, enacted uh, fake news laws or um, otherwise called um, online falsehoods law in, in Singapore, for instance, and I think other countries uh, in the region might follow suit. So it'd be, it'd be good to hear from Damar again about this. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I can feel you uh, from Nepal. Uh, I come also from the Southeast Asia where actually the situation is not e ideal like the, in Europe, in Germany. Uh, where the process of uh, leg legislation is actually biased. And uh, I will highlight on the, how the government or, or how the uh, lawmaker and decision makers uh, try to put fake news. They, they will put the fake news uh, inside or uh, the falsehood uh, inside the, what, the, what, what they define as uh, cybersecurity. So they, they approaching fake news from a perspective of this is about the national security. This is not about what we, we think uh, uh, what fake news is. So they try to like uh, forming a numbers of uh, cybersecurity policies that actually will worsen the, uh, the situation. It will contra counterproductive and tend to violate the digital rights. And also that it's always uh, threatened the recognition of human rights and democracy at, at use you say by your, uh, yourself, the product of journalistic is uh, uh, supposed to be protected because it's, uh, we have the press law and everything, but it easily uh, twisted in the experience because the, 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 the state or the government will say the other way well, when they say it, it's, not, it's not journalistic at all. It's uh, against the uh, policy of the government, so they easily can, can put uh, the journalist to, uh, to the jail. So. Uh, I will also I want to highlight that uh, what happened in Indonesia, uh, we have uh, stophoax.id, uh, the digital literacy, the movement from, uh, from the government and also from the civil society. But it is not enough because the problem is not only about uh, opening uh, the mind of the, the, the netizen, the, the person who uses social media, but also have to uh, 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 upgrade the capacity of their self to uh, secure their, themselves against the, the attack, the uh, weaponized social media as a way to attack people. So they have to uh, train the uh, train digital security to the to the society, to the women, to uh, children, and then uh, to how to protect them themselves from uh, uh, an attack uh, using the social media as a way to to uh, spreading uh, everything that uh, was, was, what is wrong. So just threaten uh, the society that if you spreading hoax, you will go to jail, it's not, it's not the right way. I think uh, they have to combine with the digital security training. Uh, that's what we do, uh, SafeNet in, in the Southeast Asia country. We train uh, women, we train journalists, we train human rights defenders how to protect themselves from, uh, uh, for instance, the unlawful uh, uh, surveillance uh, from the just attack. 
those kind of uh, training, I, I think uh, those kind of materials should, should be done also by the government and also by, by other CSO. CSO. Thank you. Okay, I think would like to give the second session for the question. You want to ask? Okay, please. Uh, good morning. I am Vlix from Netherlands. I would like to ask King Matthias and Irene. Uh, so my uh, first question for Matthias, uh, because we know that uh, Germany is part of the EU, when the algorithm works, uh, define about the, this uh, head uh, speech or uh, uh, the, the crime contents, is this like, are you considering only the Germany law or also you're considering the EU? For example, like, uh, okay, uh, you choose like some the algorithm or something that also like you must uh, thinking about how about the EU policy about this thing. And uh, for Mrs. Uh, Miss uh, Iron, I would like to ask King uh, you, because you mentioned about the Indonesia was, uh, government was shut up, uh, shut down the, twice uh, during the election. So my question, when you leverage your research, uh, conduct this research, do you also contact the government or other stakeholder and find out why they shut down for twice because um, <laughs> if we see from the human right or the public speaking this is not really good for the international because they suddenly shut down especially in the election time so that's my question thank you okay i'll get one more question or comment if not and then i'll give to matthias Okay, so um, I think there is a, um, a clear answer to your question in this case. It's, uh, I mean, <laughs> rare enough. Um, the question, or well, the laws that regulate freedom of expression and speech are um, national laws. Um, and that is true in the EU as well. There's no harmonization of freedom of expression in the EU. There are certain guidelines um, that you can argue come from, uh, for example, uh, the human rights frameworks that we apply here and that basically every country is obliged to follow. Now, enforcement of that is problematic um, because, for example, if you go to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, it is a court, and the signature countries have, um, you know, said that they will abide the rulings of the court. But in practice, this is more difficult than in theory. Now, where it becomes a little complicated is the overlap with the laws we already talked about. For example, the um, European Directive that. Um, regulates intermediary liability because what happens there is that um, you have on a European scale and on a European level these liability rules of when you as a platform or a publisher become liable for content that is on your platform. So this is sort of a meta regulation that is a European regulation but how to apply it stays national because if you argue that, for example, the content on the platform is illegal, you do that on the grounds of the national law. And then, um, for example, the platform can invoke that they are not li liable because they didn't have any prior knowledge about it and they can only act after you've uh, notified them. So there is this interaction between the European and the national law, but the definition of what is legal um, in terms of speech is national. Um, thank you for the question. So the shutdown actually happened in the province of, uh, in the region of Papua, um, where protests happened, so it wasn't during the time of election. Um, in terms of the reasoning that the government provided as to why they shut down the internet, uh, the reason that was provided, or at least uh, what was explained to the media, was that shutdown was necessary to restore order. Um, so um, again, as Damar pointed out, um, 
measures like shutdowns uh, are carried out in the name of national security, and certainly restoring public order um, has been put forward as, as one of the reasons um, as to why. Um, so in terms of contacting the government, I'm going to pass that to Damar because he's the uh, civil society, he's, he's part of the civil society group that is based in Indonesia and therefore um, can shed some light on that. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I will specifically answer the questions about uh, whether we contact the government or not. And then, actually, uh, uh, Indonesia has three times uh, internet shutdowns, and the second time we contact the government uh, to have a meeting with the minister, and then the minister himself uh, meet us uh, with uh, I myself with the uh, 20 groups uh, from Indonesia who. Uh, asking the government to stop the internet shutdown, and then uh, I think I will be honest that the 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 what, what the what the minister said in the release, the press release, they said uh, it's about controlling the uh, hoax, the fake news. But actually, in the meeting, uh, it it's it's more about the uh, restoring the social order during the. Uh, uh, during the uh, social conflicts. So uh, I, I would like to say that uh, we are really regret uh, how the government chose to, to use this action uh, without asking uh, other uh, groups uh, outside, uh, outside uh, the government, for instance, the CSOs. Is it uh, necessary to do that or not? Or is it uh, there is a process of doing that that we can uh, easily uh, understand, and is there any uh, standard operating procedures uh, re regarding the internet shutdown? And then uh, there is no such thing as uh, that process. So it's a uh, one-sided uh, decision coming from the government. So there is no uh, open discussion how to to do it. Uh, so we are asking. Actually, we, uh, uh, that's the basis that uh, we want the government to take uh, seriously. And then uh, right now, uh, last week, we already uh, uh, submit a legal lawsuit to the government. And hopefully, uh, from this process, the government will uh, stop doing the internet shutdown in the future and then uh, doing a good governance process if they want to do it, the internet shutdown. Thank you. Uh, just a short uh, comment. So during that uh, shutdown, the, the, does the government also not allow the international media to report or something, or they just allow it, the international media? Uh, they allow the international media to report. So maybe I see a good thing that there's, there's still communication up to the highest level of the government with the CSO in Indonesia. I don't know if it's also the same uh, situation in, in Europe or maybe in Germany. What do you think? I would say yes. I mean, the, this is one of the most contested issues that is debated <clears throat> or, um, uh, on the national level but also on the European level. So I wouldn't say that there is no communication happening. Uh, there's a lot of criticism, as I already said, by civil society organizations, both um, um, aimed at the platforms but also at governments making laws that, uh, you know, as I argued, uh, some of us see as a, um, problematic for free speech. There is this uh, situation that right now the European Commission apparently asked France to um, withhold an attempt to enact a new law that is supposed to regulate the spread of disinformation on the internet. And many people assume that this is because there is this Digital Services Act coming, which is supposed to be a European regulation that tackles a couple of these issues. Um, so there is a lot of discussion going on at the same time, all the time. The problem for organizations like ours is how to make sense of it. Because, as you know, 28 countries, 24 languages, the European level, and the very complicated lawmaking process on the European level. So um, let's say um, understanding who has what motivation um, and what goals is a real challenge. And uh, then 
if you have your own positions, of course, you need to find um, other organizations and other actors you can um, form coalitions with. Um, but as we already said, for example, with that Digital Services Act, it's quite unclear right now you know, what it should entail. Um, so there's a lot of, um, let's say, backroom uh, discussions. And of course, this is something where civil society is usually not included. So um, this is a challenge to find out what, um, for example, lawmakers are discussing there. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Sangha Pangabian from the Indonesian Embassy here in Berlin. Just want to add up because uh, the question I think was asked yesterday to the minister about the situation in uh, Papua. And uh, I think the minister uh, said that the, the term is not shut down of the internet, but the slowdown of the internet. Thank you. It's it's not shut down, but it's a slowdown. Uh, I think it's, uh, we, we still have one or two questions more because before we uh, exhausted the session. Any more comment or question? Or I would like to give maybe each of the panel to give uh, one or two final remarks, closing. <laughs> The only, the only thing I can say is we would like to know better what to do, but we don't. Uh, I mean, I think it became very apparent that, first of all, these discussions have to be very contextual. Um, so you have a different idea of what, for example, hateful speech and acceptable or unacceptable speech in, is in Indonesia than we have in Germany. We have a different understanding of that than the, the uh, British have, right? So, I mean, we are close together, uh, we are in the EU, we still have different ideas of what this is. So it needs to be contextual, it needs to stay contextual, and, and the challenge that arises then is that you have platforms that are global that are not bound by one jurisdiction, and, um, and, and this poses this, this, the, uh, basically this, this problem or this paradox that we are faced with, um, that we are looking for a kind of global regulation, which is impossible because we don't have a global um, lawmaking uh, body. I mean, you could think of the United Nations, but to assume that the United Nations will have a treaty, for example, on uh, speech and protection of speech is basically completely unrealistic at the moment. And as I said myself, speech is very contextual, so um, it's probably not even something that we should aspire to. So um, this is why um, these discussions are so, or why it is so hard to come up with solutions. Okay, uh, I think it's the problem for the UN also addressed by the Secretary General two days ago on the opening ceremony. He said this, this is a very difficult question to be handled also. And in, in, the, in, the, in the state level, they are still, there's a lot of still big debate on how to address uh, questions relating to the digital uh, platform era in in ICT in in the whole in the whole world I think uh, so I think if we are exhausted of questions and comments I think uh, I, I don't know how can I sum up I think a lot of things have been discussed oh Erin okay. Oh, sorry. So um, I, I will just say that um, I think evidence-based research is necessary to document the ways in which governments around the world are trying to handle the issue of uh, fake news, which is increasingly uh, becoming a global problem. Um, and I would like to stress that we need um, the involvement of civil society, much like SafeNet, so the Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network, to continue to demand transparency and accountability from governments, especially as they pursue methods such as internet shutdowns or slowdowns, as the minister called it yesterday, as well as censorship and filtering to contend with fake news. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Irene. Damar, no, any more? Just, uh, yeah, um, yeah, just a short uh, closing. Um, I really like the idea of multi-stakeholder uh, approach, uh, but 
in the reality is very hard, uh, especially in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but this one has to be pressed. Uh, we have to send a message to the government to put us uh, to listen to the, the, the academy, to listen to the technologies, and then to involve them in the uh, looking for the solution. And I, I would like to, uh, since uh, the Southeast Asia region has the tendency to copying each other regulation. So this is very important to uh, have a, a widened uh, monitoring. Uh, if the Malaysia start having a fake news law, and then the Singapore start having another one, actually the rest of the region will follow. And then if they are, co they are making an adoption based on something that they think uh, it suits only uh, best in their countries, but not following the standard of human rights, there the, the situation in the region will uh, fall down. That's, that's uh, the, the important to civil society in the region also work together to, uh, to send uh, uh, analysis and then also monitoring to each other to, to give also support and solidarity between the CSO to uh, uh, giving uh, feedbacks on or inputs to, to the government also. That's, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I would like to uh, I think conclude the session, and I thank the, all the panelists who is coming, and also the participation of everybody here. I hope we can uh, take some some stock of the what is happening in in some region in the world, and then to 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 give us inputs in your uh, any future endeavors. I think. Okay, thank you very much and good morning.